right, so we're in this Abide series, and so uh, we've act about, we've kind of looked at John 15, and then we did kind of this deep dive last week of saying, look, we're going to take three weeks, and this, this isn't just one little sermon, but really a sermon that you need to hear all three weeks to really kind of wrap your minds around. And we kind of said abiding, we ask about what that word means, or what do church people do? We responded with, well, we pray, we read the Bible, we serve, we, we give, we, we do these things, and, and we said that we we can be, quote unquote, abiding, and we can be good people, and we can do good things, yet we can actually not be connected to Jesus. And so we begin to, to wrestle with this idea of what does it really mean to read Scripture, but not just for me to feel holy, or because I have to, but it's I get to. And we say a lot of times the issue is, is we look for those shortcuts, that we look for the microwave, when really the recipe is for a crock pot. That we look for those shortcuts and the things. We want to do the things of Jesus, but not be connected to Jesus. Let me say that again. We want the shortcuts of doing the things of Jesus without really being connected to Jesus. And and the truth is, is as we look at John 15 some more today, we're going to see that without being connected to him, we can never really do the things of Jesus. So we said this is the definition of abide, and you see it up on the screen. And if you're following along with notes or you're taking notes, we encourage you to write this down. But abide is this, is to remain in, to dwell with, or be connected to. That's what that word abide means. And so as we think about abiding and the idea that we, that we rest in Jesus, like that is enough, that what Jesus did on the cross is enough. So I don't have to earn his love. I don't have to read the Bible a certain amount of times. I don't have to do anything to earn his love because he has already shown his love to us. He has given that to us. So we just simply have to rest, and that means abiding and learning who Jesus is and who Jesus is calling us to be. That's what it means to abide. That's what it means to be a disciple of Christ. And so one of the things at Capstone we started early on is coming up with a definition of a disciple at Capstone so we can have discipleship conversations. So if we never know what the target is of a disciple, then we never know how we're doing. So we came up with this, and we want you to kind of burn this in your brain and just your heart of being asked, hey, how am I doing as a disciple? And the disciple uh, is this. We said a disciple is someone who's pursuing Christ and making decisions differently because of Christ. So someone who is, who is abiding, who's remaining, who's dwelling, they're pursuing Christ, and, and they want to be more like his words and ways. And because of that, they're different. Their life looks different because of the fruit in their life. Because the more they hang out with Jesus, the more they are convicted, the more they are challenged, the more they are developed. And so that's what it means to be a disciple. A disciple isn't just someone who hangs out at church. And we talk about that a lot. There's a difference between a church goer and a Christ follower. That's what Jesus tells us in, uh, in John 15 is, look, you understand that who you are called to be and whose you are called to be. And we said, so as we look at this disciple, there's really, um, there, there's really, uh, the greatest commandment is love God with all your heart, all your soul, all your mind, and love your neighbor as yourself. That's directly from Jesus. So we looked at Jesus' life and said, really, there's, there's this vertical relationships and horizontal. The vertical is our relationship with God, and the horizontal are those who are here, those who are in church and those who are out of church, those who know Jesus, those who don't know Jesus. So we've kind of said, as a disciple, if we're going to be a balanced disciple, looking at the words and ways of Jesus and what he did, that there's these really these three phases of our relationship, not phases, but uh, areas that we can't be, it's not the idea that we teeter-totter, but we're focusing on those. So as a disciple, we should be asking our questions, how we're doing with our up relationship, our in relationships, and our out relationships. Or the way we say it is, how are we growing in Christ? How are we living as a family? And how are we sharing the gospel? And we don't really, if we look at Jesus, he doesn't say, hey, pick two. He says, hey, this is who I am. So last week we looked at up, growing in Christ. And, and we said, really, there's, there's three pieces to this kind of puzzle of the up, of going, all right, well, if I'm discipling you, and, or if you're discipling someone else, there's really three things you could focus on. Hey, how are you praying? So we talked about that. The idea of prayer, and we gave kind of that model of Matthew 6 of, uh, of acts, adoration, confession, thanksgiving, and supplication. That that's kind of the tool that we gave you for that prayer. And we said scripture, we should be in, in, in the Bible. And we gave you the SOAP method of scripture, observation, application, prayer, 
Then we talked about sacrifice, that Jesus modeled sacrifice for us. And as he modeled sacrifice from coming from heaven to earth to the idea of him uh, saying, I didn't come to be served, but I came to serve, to going to the cross for us, that he modeled sacrifice. So if we're going to be connected to him, then we need to be doing that in his words and ways. And we said the three, three ways to do that in our time, in our talents, in our treasure. Like all of those help us to be connected to him because we're connecting uh, through a, a dialogue, an intimate conversation. We're opening his living word that is living and active and sharper than any double-edged sword. And, and we're living this life of sacrifice that connect, keeps us connected to the ways of Jesus. That was last week. This week, we're, we're going we're gonna to turn uh, to more of, hey, how do we hang out with our brothers and sisters and how we grow in that? But first, let's read John 15, which is where we read last week, and we're going to continue to read. And I hope you learned this well. I hope this is underlined in your Bible. I hope it's highlighted on your, uh, on your app, the idea of going, okay, Jesus is leaving. He's about to go to the cross, and this is what he tells his disciples. This is how you know you're really mine. This is how you know you're part of my family. So this is what he says in John 15, verse 1. I am the vine, you, and my father is the vine dresser. Every branch in me that does not bear fruit, he takes away. And every branch that does bear fruit, he prunes so that it will bear more fruit. Already you are clean because of the word that I have spoken to you. Listen, abide in me and I in you, as the branch cannot bear fruit by itself. Unless it abides in the vine, neither can you unless you abide in me. Verse 5, I am the vine, you are the branches. Whoever abides in me and I in him... He is that bears much fruit. For apart from me, you can do nothing. If anyone does not abide in me, he is thrown away like a branch and withers, and the branches are gathered and thrown into the fire and burned. If you abide in me and my words abide in you, ask whatever you wish, and it will be done for you. By this, my Father is glorified that you would bear much fruit, and so prove prove to be my disciples. So Jesus says, hey, you want to know if you're my disciples? It should be that you are bearing fruit. But we can't bear fruit unless we're connected to the vine. Remember last week, if we're not connected, if we're not dwelling, if we're not, if we're not connected to that vine, we will never bear fruit. So he says, remain in me, dwell with me, understanding of what Jesus was. That our lives are forever changed. We're connected with Jesus, that there should be evidence in that, that we are seeing that. Now, again, this is the danger zone we talked about last week because that evidence we think is, well, I have a good Bible. I, I go to church. I, I do all the things. And those are the danger zone because we can think we're doing the things of Jesus. But if we're actually not connected to Jesus, if we're actually not understanding who Jesus is, and we're just trying to act all religious, then we're not really abiding. Therefore, we're not really bearing good fruit. That's what he says in verse 5. He says, apart from me, you can't do anything. You can't do anything for the kingdom. You can't do anything for my Father in his glory. Because if you're doing it for your kingdom and your glory, you can bear fruit and you can read your Bible and you can go to church. You can do all those things. But that's about you because you're not really connected to me. This is what Jesus says in Matthew 7, verses 16 through 20. He says, you will recognize them by my fruits. Are grapes gathered from thorn bushes? Are figs from thistles? So every healthy tree bears good fruit, but the diseased tree bears bad fruit. A healthy tree cannot bear bad fruit, nor can a diseased tree bear good fruit. Every tree that does not bear good fruit is cut down and thrown into the fire. Thus you will, be recon- you will recognize them by their fruits. So we've got to establish what those fruits are. So today we've kind of got a fruit-themed uh, illustration here. Uh, we've got a bowl of fruit here. We've got uh, our gray moose. Uh, thanks, Tommy. We've got our uh, capstone uh, illustration here. And we've got some lemons, all right? So we're going we're gonna to refer back to this a lot. So here's one of the things that we ask, ask and this is, what, uh, this is what Jesus says, is you will know a tree by its fruit. So what kind of tree is this? A lemon, right? Because you see little baby lemons on it. That's how we know this is a lemon tree. Jesus says, you will know my family by their fruit. Now, here's where we got to be really, really careful. Well, that just means I go to church and I'm a good person. That's what the American church has taught us. As long as you go to church, as long as you got a Bible, as long as you're a good person, that is what it means to be a disciple. But that's not what Jesus says. 
Jesus doesn't say anything about perfect attendance, doesn't say anything about Bible drill, doesn't say anything about being uh, at church at least a couple times a month. What he says is that you've got to die to yourself every single day and be willing to pick up your cross. Not just to follow rules and go to church, but to truly understand if you're connected to me, it's just not about you checking a box. It's just not you coming and sitting and go, okay, I got my message, I sang my song, now I can go do whatever I want to go do. He says, no, that's the definition of a church goer, not really a Christ follower. If you keep reading in Matthew 7, it says, depart from me, I never knew you. Despite these people doing all these quote unquote good things, he says, you didn't really understand it because you did it for yourself. You never died to yourself. You never allowed me to truly bear good fruit because you were more worried about what others thought about you and you weren't really, you kept holding on to your own life. And we talked about this last week. When we hold on to our things, there's no way we can hold on to the vine. And so many of us are holding on to our thoughts and what we think is fair and our resources and our time and our stuff and this mine. I worked for it. I earned it. And so we hold on as tight as we can. And when we do that, we can never really hold on to the vine. We can never abide. We can never connect. We will never bear fruit as long as we hold on to me and mine. Well, you might go, well, then what in the world? Well, how, how, in the, how, how am I to bear fruit? Well, the word, ne- word never leaves. The scripture always gives us direction. This is what Paul says to the Holy Spirit. says, hey, here's what fruit looks like. Jesus talks a lot about fruit. Galatians 5, verses 20 through 24. But the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. Against these things, there is no law. The idea that, that the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, self-control. That is where it begins. Not just cleaning up your outside and just not saying some bad words and just not going to rated R movies and and just not smoking this and drinking that. That's not the fruit. The fruit is in here. Love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. There are a lot of people Jesus dealt with that looked really good. And they, they memorized the Old Testament, and they said long prayers, and they did lots of good things, but they didn't take care of the orphan. They didn't take care of the fatherless. You know why? Because they were more concerned with their own self-righteousness than actually love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. Or were more concerned with being right, were more concerned with winning an argument then love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. So we get so caught up in the understanding of what it looks like, of saying, how am I bearing fruit? How am I truly bearing fruit for the world to see? And so as we continue this conversation, we want you to know that the pursuit of Christ is that that's where you begin to see joy and peace and patience and kindness and goodness. Now, it doesn't mean we're perfect. If you just see me hang out with my kid, you will see that my patience is not the patience of Jesus. But even when I lose my patience with my kids, the Holy Spirit reminds me, hey, don't forget, Jesus has been patient with you and still is, big boy. You hadn't got where you need to get. And so when we begin to have the fruit of the Spirit, we begin to go, okay, this is what this fruit looks like. It has to start here in our heart. It has to be that seed in that soil. And in that good soil, it produces a tree. And in that tree, it produces fruit. So that leads us to our second target, so which is living as a family. If you're taking notes, living as a family. The discipleship target. So, okay, so I I should be growing in Christ. All right, I need to be studying Scripture. I need to be praying. I need to be sacrificing. I need to be growing in Christ, a vertical relationship. But it's just not that I have a vertical relationship with Jesus and the Father and the Holy Spirit. It's also that I have a relationship with here people here on earth, those who are in the family and those who are outside the family. So let's talk about living as a family and what that looks like. It's the way we talk about interacting as a gospel community or as an extended family on mission. Now, you might be watching or you might be here and you don't trust the church. You don't trust the church because the church has been an institution for a long time. Are you viewed the church as more of a corporation and not really as a family? Can I tell you, it was never intended to be any of those things, and you're not wrong. If you are suspect of church because of an institution, or if you're suspect of a church because it feels more like a corporation than a family, you're not wrong. 
Because when we look at Scripture, Scripture says the church was intended to be a family. The Trinity, God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit, family. Israel was a family from the seed of Abraham before it was a nation. The way that the the church is talked about, the bride of Christ, that's us. Even the idea that we, the way we refer to each other as brothers and sisters. I remember I was at my church. I was probably seven or eight years old, and someone was getting baptized uh, behind the choir, uh, like it used to be here. And the pastor said, "And this is my sister who I'm baptizing." I looked at my mom. I was like, "I don't think my, the pastor had a sister. I'm pretty sure. I don't think that's really a, doesn't look anything like him." And that's like, oh, oh, that's what we call each other, brothers and sisters. Why? Because we're a family. This is what it says in 1 Timothy 3, 14 and 15. This is Paul talking. I hope to come to you soon, but I am writing these things so that, so that if I delay, you may know how you should behave in the household of God or in the family of God, which is the church of the living God. And that church is what? It's a pillar and a buttress of truth. That he says, look, the way that you interact each other is, is a family. Now, does an institution not as, a, not as a corporation. And just I'll go ahead and confess and apologize if you have been hurt by that, that we as a church have not done that well over the last 50 years, especially in the American church, that we've made it more about an event. We've more, made it more about Sunday morning. We've made it more about the monument of you being in a building. We've made it more about a place than the person of Jesus. Or we've made it about consumerism. What do I get out of it? Did I really enjoy the message or did I really enjoy the songs? And again, to respond, if you didn't really like the music, good, we weren't really worshiping you. But the idea is, is that we make it more about me than he. And that's what we've equated church to. And not the thing we've asked, what do I get as a verse to what do, can I give? The purpose of the church, can I tell you, the purpose of the church isn't about your glory, but his. And it is about a gospel community of broken saints forgiven, redeemed, restored family that is far from perfect, but comes together under the banner of cross. That's what it means to be the church. That's where we see love and joy and peace and patience lived out in front of one another. It's where we use our gifts and our talents to bless one another. It's where we learn how to abide and and someone taught me how to read the scripture and I teach you how to read the scripture and you teach someone how to pray. It's where we together learn how to abide. And as we do that, that love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, self-control, it comes out and then you begin to plant seeds. That's what the church is. The church is fertile soil for the gospel to be planted. That's the purpose. It's not to have the best choir, our best band, the coolest building. That's what we've made it. We've made it those things. And so again, it's the idea that we are living this out full of joy, not because people are serving me. I'm living out the fruit of the spirit of joy because I get to serve. That's the purpose of living as a family. That's the purpose of church. That's the purpose of being together. So last week it was tools. So we gave you the tools for prayer. We gave you the tools for, for scripture and for sacrifice. Now we're going to give you environment. So we would say there's three environments really where this happens and there's, there's more, but, but kind of a, a broad stroke would be the gathering. That's the first one, which is you're at right now. Hebrews 12, 24 through 25 says this, let us consider how to stir up one another and love to love and good works. To say, how do, we, how do we keep each other going when we want to quit, when this gets really hard? How do we keep going? He says this. He says, don't neglect meeting together. Don't stop worshiping together. Don't stop praying together. Don't stop meeting together as the habit of some, but encouraging one another. And all the more, as you see the day drawing near, of going, Jesus is coming back. The times are going to get darker and darker. How, as we of a church, are we going to shine brighter and brighter together? Because we're going to want to quit. This is going to get really hard. 